uh, access to new fishing grounds, social protection, which is very important, and reliable uh, early warning systems. By doing this, the G20 should refer to the SSF guidelines of the um, FAO and adopt some of the tenets of these guidelines. The last but not the least of the most important point that I would like to make is on inclusivity. Ensure that local communities and civil societies representing marginalized and underrepresented voices are included in the decision making processes. We urge that adoption of a human rights based approach be central to our ocean agenda. So, with, with the hope that the G20 will take these issues into consideration uh, and implement policies that, that, are, uh, that are in connection with these states, I, I would like to. Thank you so much. You mentioned a lot of that might be like well down in the next panel. So yeah, really good speech. Thank you so much. Uh, please, uh, Jose, it's with you. Hello. Hello. Thank you for the invitation. Too much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's very hard to follow. I mean, the ten people in your presentation. I try to do so. So, I mean, we heard about the high level policies. We heard about the, I mean, the communities that are being created. We heard about, I mean, the, I mean, the private sector, the, the public, public and private, private partnerships. But what is missing? Because pollution is increasing, habitat destruction is increasing. All that is still increasing. So what is what we are missing? It looks like we have all the ingredients necessary, but in fact they are not working. Because everything is still getting worse and worse and worse, it accelerating more and more. So my point of view, um, let me explain that I'm involved with the blue mission in the project, I mean which is to implement the mission ocean and waters in the Atlantic and Arctic region, and we are facing the same problems. We will in two or three years, it will disappear, the mission will finish in by 2030. What will happen afterwards? So what we need is a long-term platform for collaboration. This is key. You know? But what is missing right now is more boots on the ground. We've been talking about all these high-level policies, high-level initiatives and, and associations, but we need these people working every day on restoration with more boots on the ground. Is that what I'm feeling here working in, in, in Europe? I mean, we're supposed to be a very rich region. We were supposed to have all the money needed. I mean, probably the Mission Ocean and Waters will put more than a billion euros to develop all these solutions. But in fact, we don't have enough people working on that. We need much more companies, not 25,000. We need 2 million 500,000. We need much more I mean, of everything, all the ingredients. But boots on the ground, that's what is missing right now. People really working on that. We see a lot of people on Instagram, Facebook, and all that. But in fact, nobody's over there close to the coast of the ocean working on restoration. That's what, that's what we are missing right now. So what maybe G20 could do in the future is to create a platform where all these potential actors all over the world, not only G20, probably G200, you know, have enough means to work boots on the ground. Without them, it, 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 there's no way of getting out of this situation. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. I now uh, invite Laura, please, to have a word. Thank you, and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be on this panel this afternoon. As Jose said, it's actually quite hard to follow such a, a, a great opening session. Um, so my name is Orla Tona, and I'm from the Marine Institute in Ireland, so we're the state, state agency responsible for marine, um, marine research. So I am part of the coordination team, coordinating the Okeano project, so it's um, Fund under uh, Horizon Europe Framework Program um, to support the All Atlantic Ocean Research and Innovation Alliance. So, my project started only at the start of March, the first of March, um, and it'll run for three years. But it's important to say, I suppose, it's the third in a series of projects that have supported the All Atlantic Alliance. Um, so, and I suppose 
because it's the third already, there's a great community that's been built and um, Jose has been central to that as well, this community in the Atlantic. Um, so to take a quick step back, I guess, um, to, for a bit of context, the All Atlantic Ocean Research and Innovation Alliance built on the Galway Statements and the LEM Statements, which hopefully some of you have heard of, um, and also now is really focusing on the All Atlantic Declaration that was signed in 2022 in Washington. Um, so our project supports those declarations and initiatives, as I mentioned, and we have 16 partners from around the Atlantic, and including from Brazil um, and South Africa, as I mentioned. Um, so I suppose just wanted to really, I suppose, stress the network and the communities that the Atlantic has, has created and developed, um, and that one of the expected impacts of Okiano is to forge links with other EU and international initiatives such as the G20 and actively contrib contribute to the UN Ocean Decade. Um, so to stress, I guess, that Okeano and the Alliance are here, to, are very well placed as a long-term collaboration mechanism to support um, to support and advance the, the agenda of the G20 and implementation and legacy of the Ocean Decade. So, we have a strong community behind us. We're here to um, to support as well. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I was like writing, taking some notes here, and like based on um, these speeches and also from the previous panel, I took some key issues that we should like take into account after this uh, panel. Um, looks like a blue economy plays a key role as long as it is. Um, sustainable, resilient, equitable, and also inclusive. So we do have to look at people and workers, and this is a um, key point uh, stressed by Jose. And also that the G20 should engage in a solid way enough, enough to go beyond the 2030, and we, we do have to go beyond the decade period. So this is really important for us to take it on during this week here in Barcelona. And as a Brazilian, I do know that we have to look at the, the ocean as a way to have solutions, sustainable ones, and then engage people uh, early, sustainable workers, and, and all that. So summing up, uh, I would stress that looking at people finally, is key. We do also have to support ocean science, available data, uh, international cooperation and partnerships, and finally promoting uh, marine spatial planning, safe, interesting uh, financing with like the key special when we consider developing countries on the global south. And these all are key points because both short-term and long-term decisions should all be uh, science-based. So um, I invite right now Eric to have the Ocean Stewardship Coalition for the UN Global Compact uh, to, to have the floor and moderate the next discussion which will focus on ocean industry and of course we connect a lot with all we have discussed right now. Thank you so much. Very good session. Thank you so much. A great uh, family photo here. Uh, <laughs> uh, last panel. Very good. Uh, <laughs> Beautiful ocean people. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, to talk about uh, the role of the industry in the G20 and the Ocean Science, it's my pleasure to invite to the stage our next panelist, Hector. Uh, Coles from the Head of Environment and Sustainability and Energy Transition at the Port of Barcelona. We have uh, in our hand, we have uh, Remy Myers, Global Ocean Policy Lead from Ørsted, and we have Enrique Sierra, Global Head of uh, Quality and New Initiatives, Innovation and Sustainability at Iberdrola. So please. And I think. The last panel really said it very bluntly. We have all the ingredients, but we need more boots on the ground. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. We have the insights, we have the technology, we know what to do, but it's going very slowly. But, you know, traveling around and meeting some of the companies that is betting the company and are really trying to transition, there is a lot going on, but it's just not going fast enough. We're going to start actually here in Barcelona. Uh, because we are visiting your city, Hector, uh, 
and you're working on Port of Barcelona, uh, and Spain is a permanent uh, guest member of the G20, uh, and the Port of Barcelona is uh, just right out here. I'm going to visit you tomorrow in, in on site, so we're really looking forward to that. And as we heard also today, the ports are really becoming the nexus of this green transition. Because that's where energy comes in and out. All the traded goods, 80% of all trade in Europe goes through the ports. They need green fuels, and when the goods are in the port, they need green, tra green transit in, uh, in the hinterlands. So you're going to be a big hub in the future. And it's starting now, really. So what's going on in the port of Barcelona? What's your plans? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, well, I will explain uh, the, role, the role of the port in the uh, condition. Uh, as you know, uh, the 80% of the global trade, as you say, is uh, transported by ship. But it's not new. This is not new. It has been almost always. If you consider that every country, or almost every country, they have ports, and I say it's the entrance, it's the, the gate for the entrance and the exit of all the raw materials, all the goods, all the energy, it's not, a, it's not a new role, it's a, a known role. Uh, in terms of energy, the, the, the port will be also this entrance, this gate, of the entrance, of the new fields, of the future, and so on. But the role of the port is not only, let's say, the entrance as a platform, as a platform to distribute to the hinterland. I think that the role of the port has, has, has to change, has to be more proactive in, in this sense for example, the role that we want to be uh, in the Port of Barcelona is a port to dedicate spaces, areas of the port, uh, as, uh, for, for new businesses, for new businesses and new commitments to uh, the energy transition plan. So we are dedicating the spaces in the port to uh, set up uh, new alternative uh, fuel plants, not only to rush the, the common fuels, the penetrating fuels, the new fuels, these clean fuels, but also to produce in the port these alternative fuels. Because we consider that the first steps must be done. Uh, I, I, I was listening before that, that uh, some of the panelists were talking about, well, we have a high level policies, we have a high level uh, commitments, but we need uh, specific projects. We need to materialize all this. And there is a role, a very important role, a very proactive role from the, the administration, the board here in Spain, the administration, in order to invest and to promote in this energy transition. So if we want that the, the, the shipping line, if we want the new vessels in the future, can work, can be filled by alternative fuels, we have to construct this supply chain. We have to allow them to be to use these alternative fuels. So we have to see the port not only as a logistic platform, but as an energy hub. So from the port, these vessels could be filled with alternative fields. Some of them, at least the first plant, should be settled in the ports or nearby, because the vessels will need these fields. If this supply chain is not constructed, the vessels will not transform it. This is clear. But the port has not to be seen as, 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 as themselves into the port premises. We need to decarbonize not only the port activities and the maritime activities, but we have also to help and to support to decarbonize or bring activities. activities. That, that's, that's why the, the role of the board is, is wide, because all the energy is coming to the port, or most of the energy is coming to the port, and we distribute from the port to our hinterlands, to our territories. If we would help to decarbonize our activities, or close activities, industrial, or whatever, services, we can decarbonize also the land transport, because we have these fuels here, we, we, we promote to arrive these fields into the port, we can help also, and we can distribute these fields to our hinterland. So this is important. The role of the port is not local in the port. It's foreland, it's in the hinterland, it's in our premises, and it's in our territories close to the port. So the, the ports must invest in these projects, in the facilities, in infrastructures, and the energy uh, sites to produce these uh, alternative fuels and to, to promote also the electrification. And we have to pay for it. We have to pay for it. It's a new service. It will, it will create the sustainable services, a sustainable transport. This is our role as a port. That's all. Very good. I know I learned uh, also today that there are 46 ports in Spain. And I want to go 46 ports in Spain. With the new IMO GHG strategy, 
all ships have to be green by 2015, pra all practical terms in Europe, uh, late the 30s, uh, early 40s. All the ports, all those ports, 46 ports have to have green juice. And as we know from science, most of the ocean acidification, the runoffs and waste in the ocean comes from land. Most of the problems with the ocean stems from land. So the ports has a vital role in that nature reshaping of, of oceans. Uh, so this is a significant opportunity to include the cost of uh, revitalization in the retrofitting of ports, the waste management systems and so forth. So do you have a one clear recommendation for the G20? Putting you on the spot here. Well, I think that uh, most of you have ports in your complex nearby you. Uh, most, some of the ports are similar, some of them are different, some are industrial, some are logistics, whatever. But all of them consume energy, and all of them have potential uh, opportunities to create this ecosystem of, of fuel plants, or, uh, or, or to reuse uh, waste, or to produce biomethan. In the port of Barcelona, I have seen at least two projects to make, let's say, we'll, I will to explain two projects. One is dedicated to produce the biomethan, and we, as a port, we receive one 100,000 tons of waste from the sea, from the ships. And we have decided to reuse part of this uh, waste to create a biomethan plant inside the port. The other part is recycled, or almost recycled. And this is more, and this uh, bio, uh, bi biomethan will be used as a bio energy for the same ports that arrive to the port. This is one project. This is, for example, one of the projects that we can create in the port. The other one is to create a plant of methanol. We consider that methanol is one, green methanol is one of the candidates that will uh, be used for the methane industry. So we have some plants. We have a biogenic uh, CO2 in the nearby of the border inside the port. We have some regenerated water. We are in a drought, but some of uh, regenerated water are not used. So we can use this water. We can use uh, green energy because, as you say, the state has a lot of potential to create green energy. So why not to create the idea of a plant of green methanol in the world and to uh, create this ecosystem and this super chain for methanol in the world? This is an example. And it's a very good example. All different countries are exposed to states. They all have to refit their ports and the whole market systems. There's a good opportunity for them to do something. But some companies don't wait for governments to do something. No? Uh, back when I was working in shipping, I was working a lot with the Dong, Danish oil and natural gas company, which is now called Ashtel. You know, going from a pure play fossil fuel company to a pure play renewable and little company largest offshore wind company. You didn't really wait for a pressure from governments. Uh, it was your shareholders, the employees, and the leadership themselves saying, no, we want to go this way. Uh, and you didn't stop there just producing climate uh, solution with lots of renewable energy. You have also issued the first nature positive bond, the blue bond last uh, summer, and I was so happy to see that materialize. And now you're starting on, on just transition as well. Where is this going to stop right there? So, Rene, please. Thank you, Eric. Well, starting with the transition away from sort of black energy, heading into green energy is a perfect place to think about the moment that we're in. I mean, the criticality of using the G20 platform to bring together the nature platform and the climate platform. Part of why we needed that blue bond and issued that blue bond is that we set an ambition for our projects commissioned after 2030 to be net positive for biodiversity. So that means not just hitting a no net loss threshold for our projects, but when you deliver a renewable asset, you're delivering gigawatt clean energy to the grid. You're also delivering uh, oyster restoration, seagrass restoration, and trying to make sure that you're you're going above and beyond the required thresholds for what you're giving back to the environment in addition to the mitigation action that you take. And so I think this is a key moment for the G20 to make sure that we're locking in that relationship between decarbonization, net positive for nature, um, and doing so in a way that activates that work because it's not just about getting boots on the ground, which I think is critically important. It's about getting the right jobs on the ground. The ILO, for example, has great recommendations around good jobs in nature-based restoration, and those are the types of jobs that we want to deliver both at our sites, for wind turbine technicians, to the folks working in our offices, to the folks working on our restorations projects that are tied into the way that we are building offshore wind from here on out. Um, and doing that in a way that's responsive to community needs and, and demands of the industry. 
Uh, and tomorrow we actually launch it together with you a uh, uh, work that we've done with uh, lots of stakeholders on uh, uh, like a, a pathway and some principles for a nature positive option in uh, the province. And you see, I mean, we have, we have about globally 62 legal capacity, we have going to 380 legal capacity in 2030. That means for every windmill out there in the ocean now, we're going to build five, six more uh, the, the next five years. It's a massive footprint. Are we, are we able to do it in a nature positive and a social inclusive way? It's about that enabling environment. It's about the supply chain and making the investments today that we need to make. Um, I think the doing doing this work in a way that is nature positive or with the intent to be net positive for your projects, doing that in a way that's science driven, measurable, is not just a, a nice to have, it's a need to have for the development of this industry. The, we need the G20, we need COP16 to be thinking about delivering for those 30 by 30 targets in collaboration with our decarbonization targets so that we are allocating space efficiently and effectively today. We've got clear standards for what we're, we're going to be asking of the renewable